Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Well, this morning we're looking at the last of the Ten Commandments, our blueprint for living. Now, you might be thinking, hang on a minute, that time went quickly, we only just got started on the Ten Commandments. And you'd be right, because we're out of order now, because I've swapped weeks with John. But before we get started, I wanted to tell you about an embarrassing moment that I had some time ago. The previous car that we had was a bright orange so it was easy to find in the car park. The current car is dark blue, so not so easy to spot. And when we'd had the car just for a few days, we went to the supermarket and Colin stayed in the car while I popped into the shop. As I came out, it was raining and it was dark. It fleetingly passed through my mind that the new car looked a slightly different colour in the street lighting. I opened the car door to hear this strange man's voice say, wrong car, Henny. (laughs) Well, I was mortified. I was so embarrassed. Honestly, they didn't need streetlights because my cheeks were flaming. But that incident left me uneasy wherever we park the car in large car parks. I need to find a fixed point so I know where the car is. More recently, we went to Tesco, which has a large underground car park. As I got out of the car, I noticed that the stone pillar had a number 10 on it. So I thought, right, when I come out of the shop, the car is in row 10. When I came out of the shop and back to the car park, I realized that all of the pillars said 10 because it's 10 miles an hour, not (laughs) row 10. So I was still lost. Now, the moral of this story is 10 miles an hour is a rule. It's a law, but it can do nothing to help you if you're lost. And similarly, the Ten Commandments given by God to help us to live in right relationship with him and with each other, they can do nothing to save us when we're spiritually lost. We're not saved by keeping the law. We couldn't do it. We're saved by trusting in Jesus, the only one who could keep the law. The Bible says, whoever breaks, whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking all of it. Now, if we buy something new, like a a computer or some electronic gadget, we might get this big, thick book of instructions. But we also get one sheet, which is our quick start guide. The Ten Commandments are like the quick start guide, but we can't use them as a replacement for the whole Bible. I had a friend who used to say that she wished the Christian life was like a multiple choice exam. Here are the Ten Commandments. Attempt any three to get a pass mark. And perhaps you've looked at that bookmark that we gave out, you know, a few weeks ago, which lists all of the commandments. And you might have looked at that and thought, do you know what it is? I don't think I'm doing too badly here. I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't stolen or committed adultery. But you know, you can't pick and choose. They come as a package deal. The Bible says you fail at one, You fail at them all. We make rules for our children, and they ask, why? Why should I? And the answer is usually, because I said so. That's why. Now, God is a person. He's our Father, and he only gives us rules for our own good, for the good of community, and for society as a whole. When we break the Father's laws, we break the Father's heart. So we're coming this morning to look at the last in the list, but not the last in the series. Do not be jealous of what others have. When I was at school, we learned the Ten Commandments in the King James Version, which read, Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. And that meant his household, which is anything connected with your neighbor. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything which is thy neighbor's. Now, perhaps you're already thinking, great, I'm off the hook with this one. I haven't coveted anybody's ox or donkey or anybody's wife even. 
But coveting is when you look at anything you don't have, but you'd like to have, and then it awakens in you a discontent and a desire for something else other than God has given you. If we think, I don't have what I want and it's not fair. It's not fair that I don't have it, and it's certainly not fair that my neighbor does. That attitude puts you in a prison, and Jesus came to set us free. Sam Gladding in his book 10 asks, when somebody posts an achievement on Facebook, or they tell you about some thing that's happened to them, some good thing, they might have had a fabulous holiday or been out for a really expensive meal. Now, do we think, oh, that's fantastic. I'm really pleased for them. Or do we think, huh, it's all right for some, isn't it? Now, in Romans 7, the Apostle Paul wrote, I wouldn't have known what coveting was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. The bottom line is coveting is when you don't want what God wants for you. There's a conflict between what God wants for your life and what you want. And you know, advertising plays a huge part in encouraging covetousness. We're told we have to have the right phone, the right car, and what to wear. I heard, you know, in the days of the little house on the prairie, they went to the general store with a list of what they needed. The storekeeper went out the back, he filled a sack and came out. And then Woolworths came along. The first store to put goods on display where you could see it and touch it and desire it. And now, with all of this advertising everywhere, it's in front of us all of the time. You don't even need to leave the house and you can be on websites looking at stuff and buying stuff online. Jeff Hammerbacker said, the best minds of my generation are thinking about how to get people to click on ads. Not thinking about how society can be improved. They're thinking about the best way to sell us more stuff. Now, I'd like us to watch a DVD of a man who wanted to have the best lawn to the point of obsession. He wanted it to be better than anyone else's, and he envied all the garden tools that his neighbor had. This um, DVD is, for the sake of the podcast, taken from Life Explored, and it's called The Lawn. Are we getting it? I don't think he learned his lesson, did he? Now, he wasn't breaking the law, he wasn't a criminal, but he ended up losing it all. I smiled at an article that was in the paper during the week about a man whose nickname was Eleven a Reef. And when they asked his workmates, why, why did he get the nickname Eleven a Reef? They said, oh, if you've been to Tenerife, he's been to Eleven a Reef. And we've all met people like that, haven't we? You see, God made us a little lower than the angels, but we are just concerned about being a little bit higher than the Joneses. And if we start to see our neighbor as our competitor, then we become resentful of his success because envy equals desire plus resentment. C.S. Lewis wrote, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man, proud of being richer, cleverer, or better looking than others. And this 10th commandment is a bit different from some of the others because it's internal. See, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery. They're external. They're outside of ourselves. Now, my granddaughter, Etta, is studying ethics in RE at the moment and learning the difference between what is a crime, breaking the law of the land, and what is a sin, which is breaking God's law. You can be coveting, and nobody would know but you and God. Now, there isn't anything wrong with admiring other people's things. I might visit somebody else's lovely home, and I would admire their taste, but it's not that I'm wanting it for myself. You might be admiring somebody else's car or their hairstyle or their lawn even. However, if I'm being honest, there really is something that I do covet, and that's Prue Leith's necklaces. They're not gold or silver or precious stones, but when she appears on television, she always has the most gorgeous, chunky jewellery, unusual, one-off pieces, and I want them. So you see, sin is always crouching at the door. 
Now, I'm not going to find out where Prue Leith lives and break in and steal her necklaces, but coveting is at the root of so many other sins. It leads to greed and envy and jealousy, obsession, as we saw with the man with the lawn, craving and lust for something or someone who is not supposed to be yours. And coveting is at the root of so many other sins. It's really a heart issue, an internal issue that leads to an external action. Um, I want it, so I'm going to take it from you. And there are a number of examples of this in the Bible. I'll just mention a few. Ahab was the king of Samaria, but he was one of the bad guys. He wanted to buy Naboth's vineyard to use as a vegetable patch because it was just near to the palace. I mean, he had plenty of other land. He was the king. But no, no, he had to have what Naboth had, and Naboth refused to sell it. We read that Ahab, you know, a grown man, the king, went home sullen and angry. He lay on his bed sulking, was like, (coughs) and refusing to eat just because he couldn't get what he wanted. His wife Jezebel asked him what was wrong. He told her about the vineyard, so she arranged to have Naboth killed. Covetousness led to anger and then to murder. King David coveted Uriah's wife Bathsheba, which led to adultery, and then when she became pregnant, it led to David arranging for the murder of Uriah. Covetous led first to adultery and then to murder. Even further back in the Bible, we read of Cain and Abel, who both brought an offering to God. Cain brought the first fruits of his harvest, the work of his own hands. Abel brought an animal sacrifice. God accepted Abel and rejected Cain, and Cain was jealous, and he coveted the blessing that Abel had received from God, and that jealousy again led to murder. So we can even be envious of other people's spiritual gifts or other people's blessings from God. That can lead us into trouble. As I said earlier, coveting is a heart issue, and God knows our hearts. He knows our thoughts. In James chapter 4, it says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And in Luke 12, Jesus said, Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Do you know there are people whose houses and garages and loft spaces are so full of stuff that they rent storage facilities for all the stuff they haven't got room for? And to me, that's madness. Consumerism tells you that your identity is based on what you eat, where you live, what you drive, what you wear. They're supposed to show how great you are. And sociologists talk about conspicuous consumption. This is where we spend money on things that they don't really need, but to make a statement about who they are. In an old episode of Keeping Up Appearances, Hyacinth Bouquet buys Richard skis for his birthday, Now, Richard's not going to go skiing. He's not wanting skis. And when he says, why have you bought me skis? And she says, they're to go on the top of the car. All the best people have skis on the top of the car. Not going to go skiing. So what's the answer? The antidote to coveting is contentment. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 4, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether they're living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. He does add, though, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. So even though he was trusting God to see him through every situation, he was still very grateful for the support of God's people, confirming that we do need each other along the journey. Coveting is the problem. Contentment is the answer. Contentment is when we want what God wants for us. It's not about having no desires, but having desires that are for God and for good. We just have to ask the Holy Spirit to grant us those new desires. Godliness with contentment is great gain. G.K. Chesterton said, there are two ways to get enough or to be content with what we have. One is to continue to accumulate more and more The other is to desire less. So it's a challenge to stop buying and desire less. Colossians 3 says, Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, 
and now your life is hid with Christ in God. So, this is one of our ten. Do not be jealous of what others have. But now, I get to the exciting bit. I'm going to read to you Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 24. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word would be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you, you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. When Moses went up Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, it was terrifying. If even an animal had touched the mountain, it would die. Everything was designed to impress God's awesome holiness on the people. God was not to be trifled with or tread lightly. Even Moses, who had met God at the burning bush and had seen all the miracles of Egypt, even Moses was shaking with fright. The whole lesson was one of God's unapproachable holiness and the sin of every man which left us distanced from God. But we, and this is the really exciting bit, we have not come to Mount Sinai, but to Mount Zion. And Mount Zion in Jerusalem was a citadel. It was the place of safety and security. We have come to the heavenly Zion, the place of absolute security, the city of the living God, the eternal home of the redeemed. We have come to thousands and thousands of angels in joyful assembly, all of them rejoicing over every sinner who has been saved. We have come to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. And have you ever wondered who is going to be the last person on the earth to get their name written in that heavenly book? When the last name is written in the book, then Jesus will come. We have come to God, the judge of all, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And it gets better. We have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. We need have no fear. Not the slightest stain of sin or the faintest suggestion of guilt will remain. The blood of Jesus covers it all. I stand upon his merit I know no other stand. Jesus has done it all. Now, I read of a preacher who was waxing eloquent on this passage from Hebrews, and he shouted, Lord, we have come to the mountain of Zion. And a little old lady in the congregation shouted, Glory to God. Lord, we are come to the city of God. And again she shouted, Glory to God. And we are with the multitude of angels. Glory to God. And we are enrolled in heaven, Lord. Glory to God. And Lord, continued the preacher, we are not fit for such an honor. To which the old lady cried, that's a lie. And she was right. Because it says, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. We are brought near to God by the finished work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He has made us perfect. Not by us keeping the law, but by all that Jesus has done for us. We are under grace, not law. Keeping the commandments doesn't bring us salvation. We choose to obey God and to live right out of gratitude to him who loves us and died to save us. So as the old lady says, glory to God. Amen. Thank you. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk and please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes.